business then. We have uh, a brown bag, uh, and this is coming to you courtesy of Bill Ramp. The title is Making Sense of Local Food Systems, Perceptions, Concerns, and Possibilities. Uh, Bill is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Lethbridge. His research interests include historical and cultural sociology and social theory. He has a particular interest in the development of a political tradition of commonwealth thinking, especially in agrarian and collectivist or cooperativist circles, and in the moral and civic culture of early 20th century agrarian progressivism in Canada. These interests and his own childhood spent on a farm that any present day Department of Agriculture would define as hopelessly uncompetitive led him to reflect on food issues in connection to issues of land, economic and political democracy, rural culture and community, and the imperialism of the urban voice. Bill has a number of publications relating to these concerns, including Blood Money, Gambling and the Formation of Civic Morality, Global Investment and Local Politics, The Case of Lethbridge, and Health in Rural Settings, Context for Action. Um, Bill is going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll throw the place open for questions. Bill. Okay. All right. I'm uh, going to start off with a little bit of a uh, paraphrase of a uh, final line from uh, the film Four Weddings and a Funeral. Um, I'm not going to say that there will be dancing, but there will be slides, not at my presentation today, but I will get them to the apprentice and to anybody who wants them a little later. Those are still in the process of being prepared, as were my speaker notes until approximately eight minutes ago. Um, what I want to do, first of all, is uh, just introduce um, the people on this project, that's me. Uh, Trina Filan, who some of you will remember when, from her uh, a couple of years, I think, as a postdoc here. She's now in Montana, and I still rely on her insights for this, uh, this project. Katrina Kellner, who did uh, the majority of the interviews, and also Lorinda Peel, who also did a fair number of interviews with this project. Lorinda is with us today. Hello. And, uh, <laughs> She has agreed to uh, be vocal as, as needed, uh, especially if there are things, big things, that I might have uh, missed, which is entirely possible. Uh, this project wrapped up uh, very recently. In fact, re it's not really wrapped up yet. There's still a couple or three interviews that I want to do. Um, most of the interviewing and transcribing uh, was done only around the 1st of September. We have uh, just a little over 30 interviews, and uh, that's given me about 450 double-spaced pages worth of transcripts to go through. And they are just packed with stuff. Um, so I'm still reading and rereading transcripts and still pulling stuff out. And of course, it is the start of the semester, and last week I did get the flu. However, I think I can keep you entertained for a couple or three hours, and I'll try to keep myself limited to about 45 minutes, because what I'd really like to do today is to start a conversation and to hear back from some of the people in the room, which include uh, some of the people that we in fact interviewed. So, just want to say a word or two about definitions and starting points to begin with. Um, and what I want to say is that this project, this tiny little pilot project, nice tidy little pilot project that I got some money from the apprentice for, uh, which has grown like Topsy. Um, it starts from a particular kind of commitment, and that is a commitment to sustainable local food. Uh, so this is not a project which questions whether that concept is viable. Uh, it's, it's a project that starts from the assumption that it is or it can be. Um, it starts from my own commitment and the, other, and the commitment of the others on the team that it's worth pursuing the development 
of an integrated local sustainable food system. Now, that leads to a set of questions. How do we define that? Um, I don't want to overdefine. Okay, so especially starting off with, uh, with the whole idea of um, local. Basically, local for me means anything that's subnational. Uh, it can be as local as uh, what one of our interviewees called the five kilometer diet, or it can include the whole of Alberta, or even an echo region that encompasses parts of two or even three provinces. Um, what do I call sustainable? There's a number of dimensions to sustainability, a lot of which get talked about in the interview. Uh, how to have a, a form of agricultural production that lasts, that is economically viable, where the consequences are known and controlled in terms of social priorities, not just economic ones, and also cultural values. Um, so sustainability can include things like uh, economic viability, but also energy sustainability, environmental sustainability, sustainability of the health of the population that consumes the food and also produces it, uh, sustainable communities and social organizations that are involved in local food. All right, what's a food system? I'm going to work with Tony Winson here, uh, who's written a number of books on what he calls the global industrial food system. And I'm just going to pull out a bit of the way in which he talks about a food system in particular. Uh, so for Winson, uh, a food system is a system that involves integrated activities. So the integration of, let's say, production, distribution, and consumption uh, with historical and future consequences. So the past of the industrial food system, says Winson, has impacted the possibilities available to us today for how we organize food production and consumption. And what we do today, in it, again, will have impacts in the future. Uh, now that system can have a purposeful component, as in the development of policy, for example, uh, but also unintended uh, dimensions as well. So for example, you can talk about markets as systematically organized, but the way that markets operate is not necessarily as their individual participants would intend, or even the policymakers that regulate markets would intend. Um, systems involve both micro and macro integration. Um, they can be commercial or non-commercial or a mixture of both. Um, they can involve resistance to commercialization and the process of commercialization at the same time. Now, I also talk, uh, Winston also talks about integration. Okay? And there's different kinds of integration. So within a food system, you can talk about integration in terms of ownership, especially if you're talking about what Winston, uh, Winston calls industrial food. Vertical and horizontal integration of corporations, for example. Uh, but you can also talk about institutional integration, functional integration, and cultural integration. The integration also of activities of production, processing, distribution, preparation, and consumption. You can talk about the integration of broad system activities or integration of activities within a kind of a broad sector. You can talk about the integration of economic and political interests, power and resistance. You can also talk about disintegration as well. So for example, Winson tries to make the case that the increasing global integration of what he calls an industrial food system involves necessarily a kind of disintegration of democratic, socially oriented local food systems. 
Now, there's different dimensions to food systems. I just want to mention those briefly. Um, so first of all is economic dimensions, ownership, access to capital and financing, markets for commodities, production, or sorry, promotion, commodification, economic availability of inputs, economic justice, um, unequal or equal access to foods and resources. There's also political and legal activity in terms of, let's say, for example, property law regimes, uh, regulatory regimes and the interest that they serve, um, justice in access to food, water and land, democratic access or undemocratic access to food, water and land, trade policies, geopolitics. There's also a social dimension, power, cooperation, and Durkheim's big four, I haven't really worked on this, but I'm a Durkheimian theorist, and I was rereading his book Suicide uh, over the summer, and it struck me that there's four dimensions of suicide that Durkheim looks at in that book that could equally re well be applied to food systems, the way that we organize our social activities in relation to food. Briefly, those are anomy, altruism, egoism, and fatalism. Altruism, um, fairly self-evident meaning, and you see a lot of that in local food circles. The notion that it's not just the bottom line that counts, uh, it's not just what kinds of commodities can we produce for what sorts of niche markets, but we're in this and we're working hard in it for a social purpose that has to do not just with what I can get back, but what I can give to my neighbors, to the people that I feed, that I sell to, and so on. But anomie is something that works against that. Anomie, says Durkheim, is a state of kind of dysregulation, regulation that's too loose, regulation that, uh, that doesn't work well when you get different regulations that kind of conflict or contradict with each other. Uh, and I think that in the local food system, a lot of people feel this in the sense that they, they sense themselves to be covered sometimes by different sorts of regulation that don't necessarily mesh with each other, that aren't necessarily uh, tailored to the interests or the needs of small producers, small distributors, or consumers. Uh, and then there will be regulatory gaps as well. And I'm talking here about both uh, government regulation, but also regulation by uh, interest groups, like for example, organic producers. Fatalism <coughs> is a condition, Durkheim says, of over-regulation. Now by that, he can mean rules that are too many and too powerful, but also a condition of economic life in which options are few. And I get the sense from some of the producers that I've talked to that that's a feeling sometimes they have. The regulation can often be, even though it's patchy, it can be a burden. Uh, and also though that there are economic opportunities that are a bit closed off. Especially opportunities to close the gap between what consumers are either willing to pay or can pay and what the producer can accept in order to continue in business. That's a, that's a big one. That is a really big one. Uh, and egoism is, Durkheim says, it's a social condition, not so much of selfishness, but of disintegration, where people tend to live their social lives as if those lives are non social, uh, in which ties to other individuals or groups tend to be weak. And Durkheim's argument about that is that it tends to be enervating. You lose energy at that. And you also lose a sense of what's possible, what can be done. And that actually drove part of this research, at least for me, was the notion of, uh, is it possible to build 
a local food system that is also an occasion for sociality, an occasion for people to, in a sense, come out of the cages of their day-to-day to-do lists and get involved with each other and to see more possibility than they might have otherwise seen. Okay, so basically our commitments are we wanted to produce research that would support local and regional communities, local and regional food producers who are oriented primarily to those communities and to sustainable agriculture. Uh, we want to do research that promotes the democratization of local economies, local governments, local institutions, and local knowledges. We want to support food activities that are not wasteful of inputs, um, sustainably, environmentally, um, in energy, um, social and cultural consequences. Um, an agriculture that is consciously considered, not just in terms of bottom line, but in terms of how we live with each other. Okay. Um, just going to skip over a little bit here because I want to get to the meat of stuff. Um, so what this means is that we weren't particularly concerned with some of the hot topics that show up in one sphere of food systems, and that is consumption, especially consumption of branded products, but also fruits and vegetables and so on. We weren't particularly concerned with philosophies of consumption that generate a lot of heat today, like the rightness of eating organic food. What gets defined as organic food, the rightness of eating vegetarian or vegan as opposed to including meat in your diet, animal rights, um, and also issues of harm that relate specifically to agricultural chemicals or GMOs. Those are the things that tend to get the press. Those are the things that uh, uh, light up and flame out social media. And they were not our primary concern. Okay. Our primary concern is more with how people orient themselves locally in their production, their distribution, and their consumption. And how that local orientation is social. Okay, so it's the social dimension that we were really uh, quite interested in. And uh, it's interesting, when I went into this, I thought, well, that's an awful bias to carry in. Like, you're not interested in things like GMOs and so on that other people are passionately interested in. Um, and I actually found, looking through the transcripts, that Yes, there were particular individuals very concerned with one or more of those issues. Agricultural chemicals are a concern of uh, a number of uh, producers. But uh, a lot of them had the same kind of orientation as I had going in. This is not a factor of leading questions. I did take care with that. Um, they were more concerned beyond the issue of commercial viability, which is still important, with how do you give back to a community, how do you engender good relationships between producers and consumers, and do that in such a way that consumers get healthy food and learn something about where it comes from, and producers are able to make a living. Okay, so what we did was qualitative interviews. Um, I came up with and tested and formulated and reformulated and rethought a bunch of questions. Um, the reason for the qualitative interviews is because it allows a more lengthy process in which uh, people that we interview can test or resist the questions, explain themselves more, uh, give alternative accounts, tell us what we're missing and things that we should be looking into suggest to us who we should really be talking to and so on. And that um, went 
fairly well, with a couple drawbacks I'll mention in just a minute. Now I said this is a pilot project, it's supposed to be a little pilot project, and we've generated all this huge amount of material already. Where I want it to go, if I can get funding and the good people to continue to help me stay organized and on task, is a comprehensive map. Now, food mapping is all the rage these days. Uh, my partner in crime on this, Trina Phelan, uh, was in charge of a food mapping exercise in Lethbridge, looking at, for example, where are food deserts in Lethbridge? In other words, what are the areas of the city where, if you don't have a car, for example, your access to stores that sell good, healthy food, especially fruits and vegetables, is limited, especially stores that sell them at reasonable prices. So if you can't get to Savon, for example, and what's local for you is a Max or 7-Eleven, you could be living in a, in a food desert. But what I thought would be interesting is to do another kind of map of people who are actively involved in local food systems, not just as consumers, but as producers, distributors, members of social agencies, and educators and look for what are the strengths and the weaknesses and the opportunities and the challenges that they see about what they do, both as individuals and individual organizations, but also in relation to each other and to other groups. So how many producers, for example, know and are actively involved with or co cooperating in some way with other producers. How many producers have active and ongoing and rich ties with consumers? And how many of them, on the other hand, work at one removed from consumers because they sell through distributors? Um, and actually got something interesting to say about that. Um, and what we also wanted to do was to look at where the gaps are. What do people not know? What do they think they want to know? What kind of education do they need? What kinds of wishes do they have uh, in terms of knowing who else is involved in their sector of a local food system? What do they think would be needed to complete an integrated local food system? So in other words, this is not really a study of an actually existing local food system, because I don't think we really have one yet. What we have is a lot of people involved in local food, a surprising number of whom know other people very well, but some people involved in the system, not at all, and who wonder how many other people are out there. Or when newcomers come in and get involved in production and distribution, for example, how do you get to find out who those people are? How do you get to find out? where the, con the community groups are and the social agencies that are getting involved in food and what specific programs are they involved with. And those concerns came up a lot during the interviews. Okay? So a lot of people do know each other, but there is a strong sense that the knowing is not systematic enough. It needs to be more. Okay. So what did we find out? Um, first of all, let me just talk about what we found out about what we were trying to do. People had trouble with our terminology, or maybe I should say with my terminology. Uh, I am more of a theorist than a researcher, and so every time I get involved again with on-the-ground research like this. I, I, I do a lot of research, but it tends to be in archives. And so when I get involved on the ground with, uh, with local people, there has to be a process, first of all, of translation, then a realization that the terminology I'm quite familiar with is for other people just, it, it's, they get the same feeling with me sometimes as I get when I drop down to IT with the laptop for this day. <laughs> and they tell me exactly what I need to do, and I go, what? Uh, <coughs> so, for example, the term food system 
itself. Uh, people struggled, first of all, with, well, what are you asking me to do with that term? Like we asked them, how would you define food system? Well, I haven't really thought about that. Um, give me a minute. I mean, do you mean how I'm a food system, like what I do personally? Do you mean how I relate to other people? And of course, you want to be a little bit hands off, so you don't want to say, oh, okay, pick that one and answer it. Um, so there's a little bit of a struggle before people start getting into uh, what they think the, a food system might be, and then what it could possibly look like. They also had trouble, we asked about regulatory regimes and regulatory environments, and uh, a number of people, they might know about specific regulations that relate to the stuff that they do, but the notion of a regulatory regime is just that's way too kind of high sociology, really, so that would need to be translated. Um, but nonetheless, people had lots and lots of ideas. Um, my thought about the terminology question is that actually what we needed to do is we needed to do some group work. We needed to do some focus groups. Uh, or more specifically, uh, moderated free chat groups with people. Preferably face to face, perhaps we could do that mediated online. Um, but I think that would work really well with the defining question. So somebody starts off in a group tentatively saying, well, okay, this is how I would think about system, this is how I think about food, I put them together, this is what I get with food system. Somebody else comes up and says, oh, hey, here's how I would change that around, and so on and so forth. And so out of that process, what you get is a much more informed sense and a much more interesting sense, in much less tentative sense of what a food system could be and the possibilities it could hold. Um, many people, and this is, this is sort of like if any of you have ever turned on a video camera on a great aunt or a grandma, you know about this. Um, we didn't videotape, we did audio tape, uh, but uh, in the initial stages of the videos, very often people would be a little bit reticent or hesitant at first about you know, how they would define something or what they knew. Once they got into stuff, there was lots. And so what I noticed the transcripts is that, you know, the interviewer would get to the last couple or three questions, and that would be more than half of the whole transcript. Because, and, and people would be recalling stuff that he said earlier and referring back to it. So there again, I think the group process could be useful. Um, I'd like to do the bigger project in coordination with one or more local um, food policy or food security groups. Now, um, I'm a member of a group called Chinook Food Connect, and I note that there are a couple, three, probably more members of CFC here in the room. Um, and I would like to encourage anyone who's interested in this talk uh, to meet up with the CFC people. Maybe, uh, can I just introduce you Arlene and Rhonda? So Arlene Moore, who is currently chairing CFC, and Rhonda Reach as well. Um, so they know about the research that I'm doing. They are now uh, an institutional member of a research center that I had called the Center for Culture and Community. Um, and so what I'd like to do is to have this project now become less the brainchild of an individual academic and more a kind of coordinated work by organized people in groups who have things that they want to do. <coughs> now, what I'd also like to do in the next stage is look more at the relations between local food systems and local what Winston calls industrial agriculture. Well, I would probably term it more uh, export-oriented commodity agriculture, where export is, is international. Uh, it does strike me that there's a bit of uh, two solitudes there. I think a good way to breach those two solitudes is actually here at the university. Uh, we have an agricultural studies program that is very interested in uh, helping out stakeholders in export-oriented commodity production. But many people 
in that program and in the university at large also have their own interests, personal or professional, in uh, local production and consumption as well. So I think there's room for some dialogue there and perhaps also some interviews with some of the key folks in that other sector of agriculture. Um, I would like to do more interviews with agricultural researchers. We have one, and, uh, and that interview is absolutely fascinating. I'd love to talk to more people at the research centers, also retired people from the research centers as well. I'd also like to talk to more non-commercial producers. Uh, we, uh, we did emphasize getting the producer voice. We have a lot of commercial producers we talk to, but I'd like to find some way of talking to people who are engaged in production of food that's not commodified. Now, for example, that can mean uh, uh, an urban tree program. Uh, there is talk about that in the city. I, th I think there's action toward it as well. Um, so people involved in municipal initiatives to make food freely available uh, in, in public spaces. Uh, people involved in community gardens, but also individuals who are involved in their own urban gardens, balcony gardens, container gardens, and indoor gardens, and who have an interest in talking about and publicizing and getting together with others to make sense of what they do. I'd also like to hear more about uh, more from uh, educators involved in the production end of locally oriented agriculture. And I'm also thinking about how would I research and interview people on the topic of food preparation if we hive that off as an activity distinct from food processing. In other words, how people actually cook their food. And what I'm, getting, what I'm thinking about here is not just how people do that individually in their homes for themselves, but how they do that in their homes for others. So, for example, uh, one of the things that kept me going in my recent bout of flu <laughs> was the quiet provision every morning in my mailbox for a couple, three days of uh, extremely uh, fibrous, uh, brilliantly colored, and incredibly nutritious smoothies. Right? Uh, but there's also the possibility of looking at uh, more institutionally cooperative forms of food preparation, as in community kitchens. And of course there is community kitchen in operation with one of the food banks, uh, the Interfaith Food Bank in Lethbridge already. Okay, so what did we find in terms of substance? Oh boy. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip over the people that we interviewed, except to say that we got a lot of people, as I said, in the, the producer uh, category, Fork in the Road, Broxburn, Noble Garden, Synergy Permaculture, New Oxley Ranch, Lethbridge Center for Agri Aquaculture, Distributors, Gallimax, uh, Trading Cottonwood Co-op, Social and Educational Agencies, so both the food banks, the soup kitchen, uh, uh, people involved in the provision of school programs, and people now in social services who are integrating food work into the provision of social services um, as a way of increasing people's autonomy and their resilience, giving them the skills to be able to judge good food, to be able to cook food in good ways, to share knowledge amongst each other. So we're not just talking about educational outreach from experts to people in the community, but how vulnerable people in the community can get, can get involved in mutual aid to each other, sharing skills, sharing recipes, sharing ideas, sharing support. Uh, policy groups, <coughs> Growing Food Security in Alberta, Chinook Food Connect, <coughs> and uh, people we interviewed who were involved with Environment Lethbridge and Vibrant Lethbridge. Key individuals, activists and experts, one I want to mention in particular, very low-key, uh, known for her blog with uh, beautiful photographs of flowers, very interested in horticulture, but also in the food aspect of horticulture, and that's June Flanagan. I'm sure that many people in the room will know June. 
uh, and restaurants. So, so we talked to people at Mocha Cabana and Plum, the culinary department at Lethbridge College, uh, and various community gardens, guerrilla gardeners, um, local policy groups around the whole process of preparing food. Okay, so what we found is that people, when we asked them, well, how do you think about local, they tended to respond more large than we thought. So people would define local as Alberta. Or they talk about a 200 kilometer diet. There were people got more specific. One in particular uh, said, for me, local is a four kilometer diet. That's what I want to focus on. Right? That's what's appropriate to me. Uh, but there was quite a variation, especially amongst the producers, in terms of where they got supplies and also where they marketed. So, you know, people, for example, making the long drive to Calgary, uh, to Brooks, to Medicine Hat, and so on, to, uh, to market their, their goods. Sustainable, how they define that. Uh, for the producers, economic sustainability was front, foremost, and center. But not as an ideology, they weren't saying market drives everything, they were saying if we're going to do good for this community, we have to be able to live. We have to be able not to go bankrupt. Right? Uh, but they also defined sustainability in terms of healthiness of food. Energy sustainability was a big one. Okay, so I know there's been a lot of criticism of the 100 mile diet book, for example. Uh, but a lot of people still take very seriously the notion that uh, especially if you're transporting food by aircraft or ship. An awful lot of greenhouse gas comes from shipping, container ships and so on. If you're, support, if you're shipping stuff over thousands of miles, you're using a lot of energy and of course that impacts the freshness and nutritional value of the food as well. About five minutes ago. Okay. Um, all right, uh, but a lot of them also mentioned social sustainability. That they tended to look at food consumers not as individuals, but as a community. So the notion was, and I heard this from a, we heard this from a couple of producers, if we want to grow the market, <coughs> we have to grow the community. That is, the people who are talking to each other and to us about local food. Now, in saying that, don't get me wrong here uh, about <coughs> growing local markets. There's a very healthy market for local food. Producers talked about being just run off their feet. Their problem is not too much stuff that they can't sell for the most part, but not enough stuff for the demand that's already there. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me just skip down. I want to say a few things, maybe just I'll end specifically with the producer comments, because I think those, those are really interesting, and they haven't really been foregrounded in a lot of discussion that's come recently. We've, we've heard a lot from uh, the retail sector. We hear an awful lot from food consumers, but here's what the producers say. Their commitments, first of all, are to sustaining the soil as well as producing healthy food. That came up again and again and again. If you want to talk good agriculture, you have to talk good soil. That was a, like a bedrock commitment that we heard from just about every one of the producers. They're interested in organic methods of production, but not necessarily interested in the organic label, especially if it takes a huge amount of time and money to get that label. They're more concerned with doing organic than being seen as organic. Their worries about being seen relate more to the actual customers that they get to know. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of interest among producers these days in permaculture. And permaculture, of course, is kind of closed system, small scale agriculture, in which you account for your outputs the unintended ones or the ones that you don't sell and bring them back into the system again as, as inputs. 
a lot of interest in getting more knowledge of that and more contact with other permaculture producers. Big concern amongst the producers is consumer willingness to pay. Now here's the interesting, the, this is the big point that I want to throw out. And that is that it's a very small sample. We're only talking about six or seven people here. But I noticed a difference between those producers who sold through a distributor, who took the food to local markets or to individual consumers, and those producers who directly marketed their own stuff. Now, first of all, the producers who directly marketed their own stuff were just run off their feet. And a lot of them said, we wish we had food hubs. We wish we had the time to organize better distribution. We see bottlenecks in terms of both getting supplies for ourselves, but especially getting the food where it needs to go. All sorts of bottlenecks, regulatory, just transportation, all sorts of stuff like that. There is a local distribution company, Gallimax, which is helping to solve part of that problem, but there's a need for more work on that. But those producers who do market directly, who do exhaust themselves to do that work, who meet face to face with their customers, are way more optimistic about closing the gap over price versus willingness to pay. They see consumers as educable. It's the ones who are distanced by one step from consumers who tend to be more pessimistic and say things that I've also heard from industrial agricultural producers. I heard this all the time from my dad, from my dad's friends, uh, from commodity producers that I still know. You know what? The customer doesn't know a thing. They're all concerned about this vegetarian stuff and so on and so forth, and they don't realize how costly and risky it is to farm, and they don't realize what goes into the price of their food. All they want is just cheap food. Now, I didn't hear quite exactly that thing from the producers who work through intermediaries, but I did get a sense of a little less optimism. They talked more in terms of consumers need to be educated, but Education seemed to be thought of less as face-to-face -face and more in terms of get the information out there somehow about our economic needs and the kind of profit we're able to make. Whereas again, the producers who work directly with consumers, it seemed like that was already happening face-to-face. -face. Now, here's a, I'll make this my final comment. I do have a lot more I could say. Even if producers and consumers do meet face to face, and as I say, that takes time and energy. A lot of producers don't have that. But even if there is those face to face meetings, you get a pile of consumers who are sympathetic to your needs and willing to pay that bit extra. There's still a problem here. The kind of local food system that I would like to see is not a local food system that produces niche, locally branded, value-added products for which a premium price can be charged to high-end restaurants and high-end consumers. There are a lot of people who are mesmerized by that possible economic opportunity. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But for me, a comprehensive local food system is also a system that somehow takes care of people who don't have the funds, the economic wherewithal, to be able to pay a big price premium just for straight, plain, healthy food. Those are the people who, they may be as sympathetic as all get out to local producers. They may want to make those kinds of choices, but their life circumstances make it such that they're not going to be able to do that much to close that gap between what the producer needs and what they're willing to pay. So I guess my question that I'll end on, and that's, it's an open question, is how that particular gap could possibly be closed. Now I'm going to say one more thing just very quickly, sorry. <laughs> 
Just about regulation, I mentioned that produce, producers get irritated by the time and sometimes the money involved in regulation. A lot of that has to do with things like health and safety and liability regulation when it comes to marketing food. So getting permits for this and that to set up a farmer's market in a particular place, to set up at the university and so on and so forth. Uh, what I did sense is that Alberta agriculture, on the other hand, and the kind of regulatory regime that exists with Alberta agriculture tends to be rather more helpful. And in fact, there's a lot of sympathy <coughs> even for the people involved in health, safety, and liability. So for example, here at the university, uh, there's an initiative which I could talk about later involving getting students connected with producers. And uh, the person in charge of that worked very closely with our safety office and reported a very good experience. She hated the regulatory regulations, <coughs> but she liked the way she was being helped through them. Okay, so I just thought I would add that one point. All right.